It's good to see everyone here this evening. We're glad you're here. We have several visitors with us. Uh, no doubt many have come uh, because of the uh, commencement exercises tomorrow at the college. Uh, whatever reason you're here, we're glad to have you here. And you're always welcome to be uh, with us whenever you're in uh, town and can uh, be with us. Revelation 13 is our text this evening. We're going to look at uh, the imagery that John presents for the consideration of his first century readers who were facing difficulties on the horizon and try to see if we can what this might have meant to them. But we're not going to begin in Revelation 13 this evening. We're going to begin in Daniel chapter 7. So if you have your Old Testament, uh, take it and let's go to Daniel chapter 7. As we read this text, I think you'll see why we want to start here. <clears throat> Daniel 7 and verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." All right, the picture that uh, Daniel sees there is going to be the basis for what we see in Revelation chapter 13 this evening. As John sees a beast, he actually is going to see two of them, but the imagery uh, that he uses to describe these beasts are taken from Daniel chapter 7. And you may uh, recall that Daniel 7 is telling us something we've already heard in the book of Daniel uh, as we've read through it before. Daniel chapter 2, you recall that Daniel had a vision of a statue. And the head was made out of gold, the uh, arms and the breast were made out of silver, the legs and thighs were made out of bronze, and uh, feet were made out of iron mixed with clay. And you'll recall that that statue represents four successive world kingdoms. There's the Babylonian kingdom represented by the top. Anybody remember what the next one is? The Medo-Persian kingdom. The next one would be the Greeks. And then after the Greeks come the Romans. And so four successive world kingdoms. And you remember in Daniel chapter 2 that Daniel said, Then I saw stone that struck the image in the feet and caused it to fall down. That stone then grew into a mountain that overtook the entire earth. Well, we see here in uh, Daniel 7 as well that Daniel sees a little horn that grows and conquers as well. It is the same picture. And so what we have in Daniel chapter 7 is four successive world kingdoms that are represented not by four parts of a statue, but by four different really weird-looking beasts. And each one of those beasts represents one of these kingdoms. And uh, the first one represents Babylon and so forth all the way down to Rome. Now, it is obvious as you read uh, Revelation chapter 13 that John has paid much attention to this text because the similarities are just too close to deny. Uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 7, the first beast was like a lion that had wings. The second beast was like a bear. Third beast like a leopard with wings. The fourth beast is never described to us. We're told that he had large iron teeth, that he was crushing everything, and that he wasn't anything like the others. Some have suggested that maybe he's like an elephant. 
whether it's an elephant or a rhinoceros or whatever really doesn't matter, just a different kind of beast. Well, here in Revelation 13, John said, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And so you can see that John has kind of combined several of the images from Daniel into one picture. Uh, we saw that this little horn uh, uh, in Daniel 7 boasted and makes war with the saints, and the sea beast also is going to blaspheme and make war against the saints. We have mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 how long this would take. It would take time, times, and half a time, which we've already seen in the book is a way of saying three and a half years or 42 months, and 42 months is the figure that is reported in Revelation 13, and then both figures involve ten horns. So what's the point of all of this? Well, I think the point is that John is saying, if you can imagine these former world empires, the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks, and you take the worst out of each one of them, and you combine them all into one, John says that's kind of what we've got now. That this is kind of all of the evil of these kingdoms wrapped up in one big kingdom now. And so John is trying to impress us with the ferocity of this beast that he sees, its power, its ability to, to destroy, its strength, and we're going to see that it gets its strength from a, uh, a very uh, evil source as well. Um, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. The dragon that we saw in Revelation 12, remember this dragon that was going to destroy the child that the woman had and was unable to do so and how he uh, tried to uh, flood uh, the earth uh, with uh, the, the river that came out of its mouth caused her to be swept away by the flood, but it didn't work. Well, he's not done. He's still at war with God's people. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. And so the fact that he is coming up out of the sea suggests a couple things. First of all, it suggests that maybe it is foreign. Uh, that is kind of a complementary picture. We'll see the other beast comes up out of the land, so there does seem to be some kind of difference between the two. But immediately, if you're familiar with the Old Testament imagery, you know that the sea is a symbol of chaos. It is a symbol of danger. And in the ancient world, if you said the word sea, there is one body of water that comes to mind first every time. What body of water is that? The Mediterranean. Yeah, it is the sea in the ancient world. And this beast, therefore, comes up from it. Uh, first of all, suggesting that it is evil. We have the figure of Rahab, the sea monster in the Old Testament, the, the creature that is called Leviathan that lives in the sea, that are often used as symbols of wicked, ferocious, destructive empires. And that's the kind of thing that it seems is going on here as well. In chapter 17 and verse 1, we're going to see a similar image, the great harlot who sits on many waters, and is obviously a description of the Roman Empire. Well, I think that's exactly what we have here as well, that this is a representation of Rome who sits on the Mediterranean Sea. The Roman Empire was the Mediterranean basin, and all the lands that touched the Mediterranean. As a matter of fact, the Romans referred to the Mediterranean not as the Mediterranean, but as our sea, because we own and conquer everything that touches it. It's ours. So I think the beast here, number one, beast number one, represents the, uh, the Roman Empire. And we are told here uh, that in verse one, that he has ten horns and seven heads, 
And as we have noted that he seems to be kind of a composite of all four of Daniel's beasts. And on his horns were ten diadems and blasphemous names. He wears the kingly crown. Remember, there are two crowns in the book of Revelation. There's the victor's crown and there's the kingly crown. And this one is not associated with the victory of God's people. He's associated with a ruling power. And so this is another indication that maybe this is a representation of Rome. This is an artist's rendition of maybe what John was looking at. Something like this, seven heads, ten horns, crowns, feet like a bear, uh, body like a leopard, uh, whatever you can imagine that looking like. Uh, That's the idea that John's trying to get across. And it says uh, in verse 1 that on his heads were blasphemous names. In other words, he is wearing names, names written on him to identify who he is. And these are names that John says in this context are blasphemous. In other words, they are names that only should be used of God. Nothing else should be called by these names, but this thing is. Names like Savior, Lord, God, Reverend, those kinds of names. And, of course, I remind you that all of those words were used of Roman emperors in the Roman emperor cult. The emperor was referred to as the Savior, commonly referred to as Lord, commonly referred to as God in the cult, and even the case of some living emperors. And I remind you of the fact that the name Augustus is the Latin word for reverend. And so the emperor... In the emperor cult wore names that the early Christians said those names really only belong to God. And it's blasphemous in John's eyes that a human organization, a human government, is calling itself by the names that should only go for God. The beast, therefore, represents Rome in all of its arrogance, all of its blasphemy, rising up to destroy, rising up to be ferocious and powerful, to be frightening, terrifying, and pretending that it has divine power, that it is associated with the divine. We have looked at several things in our study so far uh, to show you that the Roman emperors were very fond of portraying themselves in divine terms, and they believed that they ruled by the power of their gods. And so this, no doubt, is a picture that John has in mind here as he paints the Roman Empire in this way. And if this is a frightening picture, it is supposed to be. And I think that's for two reasons. First of all, Rome wanted to frighten people. Uh, Rome was built on power, and it ruled by power. It kept the peace by force, not by negotiation or treaties, but by warfare. Rome had conquered the world by being the the most ferocious power in the ancient world. And so John's depiction of this strong, animal, beast-like figure, combining the strengths of all the strongest animals that the ancients could think of, John says, yeah, that's, that's what Rome is like. But a second reason, I think, that it is portrayed in all of its ferocity is that John wants his readers to understand that this is no feeble enemy that you're facing. That this is what you've got to go up against. This is the power that has arrayed itself against you. And so don't have any delusions about this being easy, about, you know, not going to be a big deal if you suffer or not. This thing is deadly, and you're going to have to face it. Uh, Notice also here uh, the description as it goes on in verse 2. The dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? Well, if you are a very careful student, you may have 
looked at those verses and said, you know what, that rings a bell. I've heard that someplace before. And the fact is that all of those things that John has just used to describe the beast were first introduced to us as descriptions of the Lamb. We are told here in Revelation 13 that the beast is given authority by the dragon, just like the lamb had been given authority from the father. And we've heard the refrains of the elders and the living creatures in heaven praising the lamb because he was worthy to reign and how God has given him a kingdom. We saw in Revelation chapter 5, the first time we saw the lamb, that he was standing as if he had been slain. And what are we told about this beast? That he has a mortal wound that was healed. That's a contradiction in terms. You can't recover from a mortal wound. And so there is something about this beast that was dead and yet alive. We'll look at that in just a moment. But again, it's standing in the place of only where Jesus should stand. The lamb was worshipped in chapter 5. The beast is here worshipped. The lamb we're going to see, uh, we saw back in chapter 5, and we'll see again, I think, in 17 or 18, that he has a name written on him. This beast has names written all over him, the names that only ought to be associated with the lamb. We were asked the rhetorical question back in chapter 5, who is like the lamb? And the answer, of course, to that question is nobody. He is the greatest. There is no one like Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You'll notice they ask the very same question of the beast. Who is like the beast? And the question that they expect, or the answer they expect is, well, nobody. He's the greatest power that many people had ever seen. Um, Of the Lamb, we are told that his name is unknown. Uh, We're going to see here that uh, uh, he has a mysterious name as well. Uh, Later on at the end of the chapter, we're given his name. His name is a mysterious number. The lamb wears many diadems, so does the sea beast. The followers of the lamb were marked on their forehead. We're going to see the followers of the beast marked in exactly the same way. And to finish the comparison, we were told back in chapter 5 and following that the Lamb has followers from many nations, tribes, tongues, peoples, and so forth. That is the exact uh, terminology that is used in chapter 13 here of the followers of the beast. So when John says that this thing is blasphemous, that's what he means. That he is imitating the only true Lord of Lords. That this wicked empire is posturing itself like only God should be able to be presented. It thinks of itself in divine terms. It wants people to see it as divine, and so therefore we have all of these overlapping kinds of descriptions. In verse 3, John said, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. Like we said, that's a contradiction in terms but interestingly enough, it's, it's, a, it's possible to make sense of this. There was a myth, and I think we've mentioned this before in another context, but we'll mention it here as well. There was a myth circulating at the end of the first century that Nero had come back to life as Domitian. The similarities between the two were great. Uh, they were both very wicked men. Both of them ferocious men, both of them like to be worshipped as gods and addressed as gods, treated as gods, depicted as gods. Uh, they were, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the scourge of the Roman Empire while they were on the throne. The similarities were obvious to people in the first century, and the story was going around that this is Nero who has come back. Now, if you're you're wondering, how in the world could they have thought that? Did anybody really believe that? Well, it's rather interesting the way that happened. Uh, If you were to investigate the circumstances of Nero's death, Nero did not die in public. Uh, The Roman Senate had put out a warrant for his arrest, and rather than be arrested and executed by the Senate, he fled the city 
and committed suicide at the house of one of his slaves. There were no witnesses to the death of Nero. And the rumor began to be spread that do we really know that he's dead? It's not like you could see his dead body in the Roman Forum after that. The fact that his death had happened out of sight caused some people to wonder, did he really just die or did he stage his death? The story is told that his body was thrown in the Tiber River, so if you don't have a body around, the idea is able to gain, gain some credibility that maybe he's not really dead. Maybe this is all just a hoax. Maybe Nero's just gone into hiding. And when Domitian came to the throne, some people thought, well, there it is. This is Nero all over again. We think that, well, that's kind of a strange thing to believe, but it happens all the time. Uh, back in 1996, was it, the Branch Davidian thing in Waco? Uh, after that big disaster and David Koresh was killed in the siege. I don't know if you pay attention to tabloid magazines, not that I do, but for about two months after that, the headlines in all the tabloid magazines were, David Koresh is alive. For some reason, people don't just want to accept that somebody like that has died. And the fact that he dies off camera, his body is burned beyond recognition, there is kind of doubt that maybe that's really him. Well, some people began to circulate the rumor that he escaped. Back in 1976, Elvis died. And ever since then, people have been saying he's around. Uh, you know, it's like that in the ancient world. There were questions that could not be answered that led some people to wonder, is there some kind of conspiracy? I think that's what John is referring to here, that there is this imitation of a death and a coming back to life, mortal wound and yet healed. It seems to me that that's a reference to that story that was going around. And so we have here kind of a resurrection of evil as opposed to the resurrection of the Son of God in the gospel. And of course, to many people, Nero was the personification of all the evil that Rome had ever seen. And if you're not familiar with how evil Nero was, pick up a, a dictionary or encyclopedia and read his biography. You will be appalled at the life that this man lived. Horribly, horribly wicked. John says in verse 4 that they worshipped the dragon because he, that is the dragon, gave his authority to the beast. And so to worship the beast is simply to worship the dragon. To worship this empire, to say that it is divine, that it has divine power behind it, that it acts like a god, is only to worship the evil Satan who is using this empire for his purposes. We noted in chapter 12 that Satan was unable to defeat God on his own territory, and so Satan's ploy then is, then I'll destroy God's people. I'll destroy the kingdom of God. And he wages war with the saints on the earth. This is how he does it. He has enlisted the Roman army as, or, or the Roman Empire as his tool to destroy God's people. And it says here uh, that they worshipped the beast, verse 4. And we might look at that and we say, well, that might just be kind of heightened figurative language, but really it's not. If you lived in the first century, you would have known exactly what John was talking about because Rome, the empire, the power of the empire, was personified as a goddess, and her name was Roma. There she is right there, in Roman armor with a shield, and the figure here is the Roman Senate hailing Domitian. Uh, here we have the Temple of Roma at Ostia, which is the port that served the city of Rome. Uh, here is Roma sitting uh, in a more leisurely pose on the altar of peace that sat on the, uh, the hill of Mars or the hill of uh, the plain of Mars uh, in Rome. 
This is the temple of goddess Roma in Ephesus, or what's left of it. Uh, it stood in this square area here. This is an artist's reconstruction of what you would have seen in Rome. You can see right next to the Colosseum was the temple of Venus and Roma. Remember that Augustus claimed to be a descendant of the goddess Venus. And so combining deities, worshiping two that are similar together, Roma, Venus, not a, you know, a lot of overlap between the two ideas in ancient thought. And so there was this great temple to Venus and Roma in the heart of Rome. Standing there is a recognition of the power of Augustus and the empire that he created. Well, uh, look at verse 5. There was given to him a mouth, just like the horn, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now, we've read chapter 11. We know about 42 months, right? Remember, the, the people of God were there depicted as a temple, and God measured off the temple and said nothing inside the walls gets harmed. The courtyard is given to be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles for 42 months. There will be persecution, but there's also safety in the midst of persecution, safekeeping and protection. Well, here we have the 42 months. This is how Satan is going to wage war against the saints with this evil empire. So he uh, speaks arrogant words and blasphemies, challenging the very things that Christians say saying that, no, your God is not the God of, of the empire. Our emperor is. He's the God. Worship him. And it's hard for us to imagine that, maybe, but you have to realize that herein lies the essence of the conflict, that the Christians were being asked to worship somebody that in good conscience they could not worship because that's the kind of worship they had to give to Jesus and only to Jesus. And they were being asked to recognize a man, the Roman emperor, and a wicked one at that, as a god. And the Christians said, we can't do that. And so he speaks these arrogant words. He makes these arrogant claims and blasphemous claims, speaking as if he were to be thought of as a god. And he is going to use his power to try to force people to recognize him. That's the, the persecution Verse 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Tabernacle, again, is the people here, God and his people, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So just like we see back there in Daniel 7, the passage that was brought to our attention here a moment ago, uh, he is an enemy. Horns in the uh, biblical uh, apocalyptic literature represent power, usually oppressive power. And so just like the horn in Daniel 7, here we have the beast making war with the saints. And notice John says to overcome them. We have to keep that in context, right? In chapter 11, we saw that the people of God were symbolized as two witnesses. And they are killed we are told back in chapter 11. The beast comes out of the abyss, makes war with them, overcame them, and kills them, and their dead bodies lie in the street. But we saw that that conquest was not a permanent one. It was only an apparent conquest because the saints, the two witnesses, come back to life and are taken to heaven, and then the kingdom of evil is destroyed. John's showing us that same picture again here. And again, just like we've seen in the rest of the book of Revelation, this is not one event after another. It's multiple views of the same event. So it's just different imagery here in chapter 13, but the same story. Uh, he is given this uh, to make war with the saints and to overcome them, but not permanently. It will look like he has overcome them for a while, but he will not have won. And he has authority also over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation, a fitting representation of the empire itself. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Notice the contrast, as we've noted before, verse 6, those who dwell in heaven are the people of God. Those who dwell on earth are the unbelievers. And so we have here a contrast 
uh, between the slain lamb and this emperor who are vying for the attention and the worship of people, and wicked people will worship their false god while the people of God worship the true god. Um, John tells us and reminds us in verse 8 that everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the life, book of life of the Lamb who has been slain, um, those are the people who are going to fall for this and eventually get carried away by it. And so that's the picture that John gives, first of all. This is what you're facing. And he then stops in verses 9 and 10 to give a warning. If anyone has an ear, let him hear, which is a phrase that Jesus used to use in the Gospels, which is kind of his way of saying, I hope you're listening carefully. John uses that here to make the same point. Pay attention to this, as it were. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. We hear that same kind of expression in Jeremiah 15 where God tells Jeremiah to prophesy these, this very thing to the people. They're wondering, are the Babylonians going to take us, or are we going to be able to defend the city? And if we get enough people together, will we be able to fight the Babylonians and drive them off? And the message Jeremiah gives them is, he who is destined for the sword will go to the sword. He who is destined for captivity will go to captivity. In other words, there's no way out of this. And we have the same kind of message here. No, God is not going to spare you, uh, allow you to be spared from this. You're going to have to go through this. Just like Israel had to go through the wilderness and it was hard and difficult. Just like the Israelites had to go through captivity and many of them died to learn their lesson the hard way and those that lived had to live in captivity. Well, John says, you're living on a battlefield. And you're going to have to go through this. You live in a wicked world surrounded by unbelievers. And yes, there's going to be hardship. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be captivity. And it's not going to be possible to fight this with the sword. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword, he must be killed. You're not going to be able to fight this enemy by picking up arms. And it's kind of a warning not to even try. Does somebody have John 18 and 11 uh, handy and could read that passage for us? Jesus spoke in similar terms. Go ahead. Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put your sword in your sheath. The cup which the Father has given you shall not drink it. Similar message there to Peter at the, uh, right before Jesus was arrested. We're not going to fight that way. That's not how this battle is won. And so John's point is, Yes, it's ferocious, it's dangerous, you're going to have to face it, get used to the idea. And if that doesn't sound very comforting, well, maybe it's not on one level, but remember that we've seen this before in other classes that we've had, Brother Dickey has taught as well, that God often tells his people what's going to happen so that they're not surprised by it when it comes. And it might have been that at the end of the first century, all things are kind of relatively calm. There is no record of some kind of government-wide persecution going on in Domitian's day. But John says, this is what's coming. This thing's going to rise up and try to kill you. And I want you to know that ahead of time so that when it happens, you don't fall apart, that you're ready for it and you've made up your mind that you're going to stand fast. I've often been of the opinion that... This crisis had to happen at this time. It was necessary for the kingdom of God to be tested. It had to be able to prove that it really was the great kingdom that God said it was. And the only way to prove that is in warfare with a rival kingdom. And the only way to prove that you are the greatest kingdom on earth is to defeat the greatest kingdom on earth. There is a sense in which the early Christians had to go through the worst persecution in order to prove the strength of God's kingdom. And I don't think that there has been anything like this since. 
And I think one of the messages of the book of Revelation is that if God can defeat this enemy, he can defeat any enemy. And that gives us the hope that even if this is about the Roman Empire, as we've suggested, that the message is that God can destroy any rival kingdom. So it's not, you know, there is message there for us as well. Well, I think we're out of time uh, for this evening then. Uh, We will try to look at the second beast uh, next time. Thank you very much.